The room was dimly lit, the only sources of light coming from the small lamp on the psychologist's desk and the city lights filtering through the window. I sat across from Dr. Hoffman, my Navy SEAL cap clutched in my hands, my gaze fixed on the floor. It had been weeks since I returned from that mission, but the memories were still fresh in my mind, haunting me like a relentless ghost. Joel, I know this is difficult, but I need you to tell me everything that happened. Dr. Hoffman's voice was calm, reassuring. Taking a deep breath, I began recounting the events that had unfolded in the remote village between Serbia and Bulgaria. Our mission was straightforward. Locate the intel on a Russian spy who had stolen plans for a new weapon and returned safely. We were a seasoned team, confident in our abilities to handle any situation. The chopper ride had been uneventful until we reached the dense woods of Serbia. A sudden malfunction caused our chopper to crash, leaving us stranded in unfamiliar territory. With our GPS and communication devices damaged, we had no choice but to rely on our training and use a compass to navigate towards the nearest village. Night had fallen by the time we reached the outskirts of the village. The darkness was suffocating broken only by the faint glow of the moonlight filtering through the trees. That's when it happened, a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. At first we dismissed it as the sounds of the wilderness, but then we heard it again, closer this time. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as we readied our weapons, scanning the darkness for any signs of movement. And then we saw it, a bipedal creature emerging from the shadows, its form resembling that of a massive dog, but with an unsettlingly humanoid stance. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, reflecting our flashlight beams like beacons of dread. I could see the glint of its sharp claws as it bared its teeth in a menacing snarl. We opened fire, the shots echoing through the silent woods as we fought for our lives against these dogman creatures. They were fast, agile, and seemed to move with an otherworldly grace. It was a battle unlike anything I had experienced before, a primal struggle for survival in the heart of the wilderness. Somehow we managed to fend them off and escape deeper into the woods, using every ounce of our training to evade their relentless pursuit. Eventually we stumbled upon the village we were seeking, retrieved the vital intel, and made our way back to safety. But even now, as I sit here recounting the encounter, doubts gnaw at the edges of my mind. Did we truly encounter those bipedal dogmen, or was it just a trick of the darkness? A manifestation of our fears. I can't shake the feeling that something terrifying lurks in those Serbian woods, something that defies rational explanation. Dr. Hoffman listened attentively, nodding occasionally as I spoke. When I finally fell silent, he leaned forward, his expression thoughtful. Joel, what you experienced out there was undoubtedly traumatic, but it's important to remember that our minds can play tricks on us, especially in high-stress situations. We'll work through this together, and in time, the truth will become clearer. I nodded, grateful for his words of reassurance, but deep down I knew that some secrets were meant to remain hidden, in the shadows where even the bravest souls feared to tread. While my mother and I were grouse hunting up by Bina on Six Mile Lake Road in the Mud Goose Management Area, we both witnessed a Bigfoot. We were traveling down 20, 127 from east to west, and my mom said, Whoa! back up, down trail 20, 266 near the bend. We saw a Bigfoot off the trail in the grassy ditch, and it slowly moved off the trail west to east. My mom asked me if it felt like it moved in super slow motion. I concurred. The ditch at the site was three feet down the grass at the side of the trail, was three feet tall, and the upper torso was three, four feet above the grass, leaving the Bigfoot to be approximately eight. Ten feet tall. We drove to the spot and both noticed a strong sulfur or rotting vegetation. 
when I got out of the car and immediately felt all my hair stand up on my body. I checked for any sign of footprints on the road. I could not see any due to the gravel being very packed down. There was a small bit of gravel disturbed in one spot near the west side of the road shoulder. We later got stopped by the local. Coal Conservation Officer, Ake Game Warden, checks on hunters. When we mentioned what we had seen and where it was, he remarked that's where people have been reported seeing a Bigfoot. My mother and I have no doubt that we saw one. This happened in 2011 when I was in training for Peace Corps service in Cape Town, South Africa. Most houses here have bars on the doors and windows and are surrounded by gates and fences. The village that I trained in was large and sprawling. My host family was wealthier than most, and while the house was nice, most neighbors had much simpler dwellings and tin shacks. Our fence was tall and stable, with a thick wall of a gate in some of the neighboring fences were small barbed wire. The training schedule was packed, and I was usually gone all day, every day. When I got home in the afternoons, I would often play with some neighborhood kids. Sundays were my only day off. One particular Sunday, towards the end of training, I was home alone. I was outside hanging laundry and noticed two small boys, about seven, eight or so, in the next yard, staring at me. I'm white, and I'm used to this reaction. I'd never seen these kids before. I smiled at them and continued to hang my laundry. They continued to play and stare at me. My unease with these kids grew, and I thought it was because I was annoyed with being stared at. The longer they watched me, the more creeped out I felt. I looked up to notice that they were gone. I quickly went inside and locked the door. The gate was already locked and there was a tall fence surrounding the property. I looked out the window of my bedroom a few minutes later to see one of the kids scaling the fence. I thought about going out there to say something but felt compelled to stay inside and ignore them. The next time I looked the kid had just landed in the yard and somehow he saw me through the sliver of window. I was peering out of and made eye contact. Then I noticed that this kid had eyes that were solid black. I felt like he was reaching into me and grabbing my insides. The kid prowled around the windows and door for a while. I don't know what happened to the other kid, but by that time I was totally creeped out. I moved to my permanent site shortly after that. All I know is that the encounter I experienced frightened me so much that even after all these years, it still shakes me up to think about it. Until that evening, I've always thought of werewolves as being nothing more than just fairy tales. But that first encounter has left a huge question mark inside of me. I come from a family of skeptics, so I decided not to tell anyone about what happened to me. Then one night, my brother came home trembling and pale. He told me about his experience, and I felt relieved that I wasn't the only one that seen something. It was after 10 p.m. on New Year's Eve in the late 1980s. We were living in a suburb of Tampa, Florida. It was either 1987 or 88. I was sitting out front of my parents' home, and instead of going out with my friends, I decided to stay home and celebrate the new year with my family. My father's car was parked in front of the house by the road, so I decided to sit on the hood, smoke a cigarette, and wait until midnight. The rest of my family was in the house celebrating. After about an hour, I heard a strange sound coming from the neighbor's yard across the street. It sounded as though a man was moaning in pain. The street and the property were dark, so I couldn't see much except for a small light that shined off in the distance on the back part of the property along a cinder block wall. The wall where the light was sitting wasn't finished yet. The whole property itself was wooded with trees and tall bushes. The bushes on the property stood around five feet high and over and around five feet in width. I kept looking in the direction of the sound to try and see what was causing it. My first thought was that maybe someone was hurt, but then the sound changed. It went from a moaning to a low-pitched gurgling, then growling. 
The next thing I heard was a loud thud, as though something huge jumped and landed behind one of the bushes in the back part of the property. The sounds that followed were the sounds of something seriously heavy on all four legs, darting behind large bushes, moving towards me in a zigzag pattern. I started questioning myself as to what the heck this thing was. Was it a horse or a dog? It sounded so heavy, and I could hear its breath when its feet hit the ground as it came closer. I heard the growling again, and it was like no dog I had ever heard. It was at this point that reality hit me, and I realized that this thing was coming towards me. I suddenly felt the rush of fear go right through me. It stopped behind a huge berry bush that was across the street from me, which was about 15 to 20 feet away. It suddenly became quiet, and I couldn't hear the breathing or the growling any more. I eased myself down off of the hood of the car because I didn't want to make any sudden movements, especially since it was so close. The front door was about 30 feet away from where I was, and I didn't know if I would make it. I didn't know what this thing was, and I didn't want to find out. I was so scared I could hardly breathe. My parents had a lot of bushes and trees in their front yard as well, so I noticed a gap in between a couple of them, and I started running. As soon as I started running, that thing started coming after me. I could hear it behind me as it came across the street. I heard its nails scraping the asphalt once or twice as it crossed onto our property. I was not about to look back, and as soon as I reached the front steps, I jumped to the top step and quickly ran into the house and locked the door. I was shaking so bad that I felt like I was going to pass out, even with the music playing inside the house. I heard the thing outside the front door growling, and then it went quiet. I heard another thud as though it jumped off the step onto the grass, and I couldn't hear it any more. Suddenly I heard my brother, in-law speak over my shoulder, asking me what I was looking at. I jumped and thought I was going to choke on my own words. All I said to him was that whatever he did, do not go outside. He started smiling and said, Oak. I guess he thought I was joking, but then he realized I wasn't. As soon as I took a couple steps away from the door, he opened the door and went outside to check, but didn't go down the steps. He quickly came back in and didn't say anything. I asked him if he saw anything, and he said there was nothing there. I didn't tell anyone about it, not even my brother-in-law. Later that night, around 12.30 a.m., after everything quieted down, I was in the kitchen drying dishes when I heard the most terrible snarling growl right outside the window where I was standing. I suddenly dropped the plate I was holding, and it shattered on the floor. The fear crept back, and I started trembling again, realizing that the thing was still outside, but it was along the side of the house towards the back and not the front. I backed away, staring at the window, but it was pitch black outside, and I couldn't see anything. My mother came into the kitchen and complained about me dropping her plate. I still didn't say anything because I didn't think my family would believe me. I did tell my father that I thought I saw someone outside looking into the window. He grabbed his gun and went outside with my brother. In law and yelled, trying to scare them away. It must have left after that because they didn't see anything. Until now, my sister was the only one who knew only part of my story. My story comes from the Crow Indian Reservation of Montana. I was dating a Crow tribal man at the time. I'm not sure how the subject came up, but he shared several experiences with me about his and his family's encounters with the Sasquatch people. When he and his brothers were little, they were playing in the woods when they saw some bushes rustling. They thought it was probably a skunk or raccoon in the brush, and they started throwing rocks at it. He said suddenly an enormous Sasquatch stood up and yelled at them. It chased them and they ran home as fast as they could. Looking back as an adult, he said it could have caught them at any time, but only seemed to want to scare them away and back home. He joked it was rather like an elderly neighbor yelling at naughty kids to get off his lawn. He described it as about eight to nine feet tall and had white hair. He felt it was an elder. He said there were many sightings over the years, males and females in varieties of colors, but mostly brown and black. 
but there are a few gray and white. A brown female would often peek around a tree and look at the laundry on the line. She seemed curious. He said a fire came through the area and burned out the food sources that they ate. They moved on, and they haven't seen signs of them since. They also have many stories of the little people, and sometimes they are seen with a Sasquatch. Most of them will not talk about the little people, as it's considered disrespectful and bad luck. But there are stories of the little people helping the crow. I won't repeat those stories out of respect I have. Some of my Crow and Cheyenne friends on the reservations have had many Sasquatch sightings and UFO sightings. Maybe I can convince some of them to email you their personal experiences. I wish I had more details, but that's all I can remember about his stories. My personal story happened near Nye, Montana. My friend and I wanted to pick the perfect spot after hiking in. We saw a wooded little island in the middle of the Stillwater River. It was so perfect, we waded out and set up our tent in a clearing in between the trees. We had a lovely night. We chatted away, cooked some great food, and went to sleep. I woke up in the morning to small pebbles hitting the side of the tent. Then something poked my side of the tent like a finger. It was close to the zip-up window, so I unzipped it a crack to see what was outside. There was absolutely nothing, yet something unseen continued to slowly poke the tent. I poked my finger to the outside, then it would poke. Then it poked the top of the tent, then I poked the top of the tent. I was not afraid, I was just more curious as to what this invisible being was. I didn't feel any malevolence from it, more like it was just playing a fun little game. This went on for several minutes, and then it seemed to get bored and stop. When my friend woke up, I told her what had happened. We looked all around camp, and no clues, no prints, nothing disturbing. Just a beautiful Montana morning with an odd experience. I'm Irish and grew up on myths about fairies, giants, and other fey folk and Celtic legends. The fake or the unseen people can either be helpful and friendly or malicious, depending on how humans interact with them, by doing something that annoys them. They can be mischievous to outright dangerous. It makes me wonder if our ancestors actually knew the truth and we turned truth into mythology as we became civilized. I truly believe in the unseen people, not just the Sasquatch people, but probably many other beings. I have no idea what was poking my tent. I should have been able to see something. But all I could see was a tent fabric being poked by an invisible finger. I don't know what type of being it was, but it let me know it was there without showing itself. Maybe someday we'll find the truth about the other people, or the good folk, as the Irish affectionately called them. My friends and I were hiking back down a trail and didn't realize how dark it would get so quickly. We somehow got confused and took a wrong turn. I noticed an overturned shopping cart and said we went the wrong way. As we turned around to backtrack, we heard some rustling in the bushes. We had flashlights, but none that were that good or powerful. We shined the light, and all we could see was half of a stark white face peeking out at us from behind a tree. It looked like a mask, but it had no facial features other than eyes. We sprinted down the trail and back to our car. When we got to the car, there was an old dirty kid's doll on it. We jumped in the car and drove 500 miles per hour out of there and never spoke of it again. I was a teen and was heading back home late one night after hanging out at a friend's. My parents were gone and I would knock on my sister's window and she would let me in or leave the back porch light on and the door unlocked. I walked through a well-lit neighborhood and down an alleyway. As I was walking through the neighborhood, a little red car sped past me out of nowhere. I was a little alarmed, but thought nothing of it. A few minutes later, I was jolted out of my skin when the same car drove by going so slow. I didn't hear it or notice it until it was right next to me. I ran away and went behind the house, and the car sped off. I stayed there trying to collect my thoughts and figure out what to do. 
This was before cell phones were a thing. As I was calculating the quickest way to get home, the car comes back, driving on the wrong side of the road and stops at the curb a few houses away from where I am. An older man steps out of the car and is butt naked, holding a knife. He runs up and down the sidewalk, looking around, then stops and listens. After a minute, he lets out a scream that chills me to my core. Suddenly, a porch light comes on, and someone opens their front door. It was the house I was hiding at. I run to the door and burst into tears and tell the lady everything. The naked guy takes off, and the police come. I tell the police office what happened, and he doesn't believe me. Long story short, he thinks I'm just making it up, or seems annoyed by the situation or something. I got the F home and never, ever stayed out after that. I've posted on here before about something that happened a few years ago. Long story short, I was walking my dog at night when I saw in the forest, lit up by the orange street lamps, what looked like a deer standing up, but when I looked at its head, I couldn't understand its face. As in, its head or face was sort of shrouded in darkness, as if my mind couldn't comprehend what it was seeing. Strange, but explainable. Last night, years after that encounter, nothing strange had happened up to now. I was sleeping, my bedroom situated facing the road, with my windows open. I am normally a deep sleeper. But I woke up to the loud sound of bird noises. At first I thought nothing of it simply birds calling in the middle of the night. But over time, I noticed something. It's hard to describe, but it sounded as if about every five seconds or so, there would be a different bird call. And the calls weren't different sounds, as in certain birds make different pitched noises or hoot, etc. Instead, it was the same whistling noise. Not like a whistle blowing, but instead like the noise a songbird would sing but in different arrangements, for an hour straight. It was very loud, loud enough that I covered my head with two pillows and was still woken. It was just repeating the same fifty different calls or so in the same order. It was as if one type of bird was imitating the different calls it heard over and over in the same order. The noise was about twenty-five feet away, coming from the thicket next to my house. There was no sound but the calling noise. No crickets chirped, no frogs called. Hell, no cars drove through the neighborhood. I also faintly remember the smell of rotten eggs, but this may have been a trick my panicked mind played on me. Eventually it stopped and I fell back asleep, terrified. I had kept my eyes tight shut. I woke up again about fifteen minutes later, hearing the sound seemingly further away, down the street, but again in the same exact order. Then later through the night, I heard the noise again, either in the same spot as before and louder or right outside my window. I faced away from the window and kept my eyes shut, horrified but in such a tired state that I simply stayed put, not able to think of anything else. What the F was that? Does anyone have an explanation for this? I know my description may sound strange, but it's hard to put in words. All I know for sure was that it was not natural. This wasn't a bird or crickets or a frog, no. It was something else. I am an avid hiker in East Tennessee, and I have hiked most of the trails in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I've had many wild boar encounters. I'm not easily spooked, nor do I feel uneasy being alone in the woods, but I will admit that one incident left me feeling a bit weird. I was hiking a trail in the mountains near Tremont, Tennessee, in July of 2019. It was an unusually warm morning, and the wind was blowing. I could tell the storm was coming, but I thought I could get a ten-mile hike in before it got here. The trail I was hiking was steep, and there was a good-sized creek I would have to cross that was about knee-deep. I was keeping a close eye on the weather and making good time. At about three quarters of a mile from my turn, around point, I heard brush breaking above me on the side of the mountain. It sounded like more than one of something, or someone was walking, not running. 
I stopped to listen, but the wind picked up so I couldn't hear anything. When the wind died down, I heard brush breaking again. The side of the mountain was covered with rhododendron, so I couldn't see more than 30 yards up the mountainside. The wind picked up again, and I hit it on thinking it was probably a bear, a hog, a deer, or maybe even a person. But by the time I reached the turn, around and started back down the trail, the weather was getting worse. When I reached the spot where I'd heard the brush breaking earlier, I heard what sounded like people talking gibberish. I thought, okay, it was people breaking brush on the mountainside. That's no big deal. I've heard this gibberish before, and most times I will eventually meet with a group of people somewhere on the trail. But as I came around the bend in the trail where my mind said I should have seen people, there was no one there. I stopped again to listen. The wind began to pick up, but I could faintly hear the gibberish. I waited a minute for the wind to die down, and when I did, I could hear the gibberish much clearer. It was like listening to a conversation that was just far enough away. Not to be able to make out the words, but it was close enough that I felt like I should have been able to. I was puzzled. At the point where I turned around, there was an unmaintained trail that goes to an old fire tower site. I thought maybe someone had tried to follow it and gotten turned around. Most people go there in the winter months because it's so overgrown. I thought that maybe I should yell at them to let them know where the trail was. This entire time, the wind was gusting in my face. If I yelled at that point, no one would hear me anyway, so I, I waited for a break. When I could hear the gibberish again, I yelled, hey, the second I did that the gibberish stopped. The distance I was covering was ten yards up and down the trail. I was facing up the mountainside with my right up the trail and my left down the trail. There was a small creek behind me that was little more than a trickle, and as soon as the gibberish stopped, I heard movement to my right up the mountainside. I moved in that direction looking up the hill. I was thinking I should bark like a dog. I've done this many times while hiking, and it has always successfully scared the crap out of people. As soon as I did, I heard something to my left. Something was coming through the tree canopy, and a rock landed in the creek behind me. I could hear more than one of whoever or whatever was moving above me. That rock made me mad, and I thought that these knuckleheads were throwing rocks at me. I moved down the trail to where the rock landed. The water was still muddy. I picked up the rock and threw it back, yelling, Stop throwing rocks at me. I was looking up the hillside to my right, near where I had just been. I heard a whistle, and I quickly ran back over to try to catch the culprit. The brush right above where I had just been standing exploded with a loud crash. I turned and ran back in that direction. As soon as I did something loud, crashed through the brush to my right and around the bend. From where I was, something had crossed the trail from the creek and was headed up the mountainside. I ran up the trail as fast as I could to try to see what it was, but I wasn't fast enough. I couldn't see any tracks, but the hillside was alive with activity. The brush was breaking like crazy, and I could tell it was moving. I've always thought that if I ever come across something I couldn't explain or see I would try and track it down, but that was not the case. I didn't want to follow this thing, nor could I have kept up with it if I had wanted to. I remember standing there thinking that I had just been played. I didn't know which way was up. For a moment, something inside me said that I should move on down the trail. So I did, and from then on, I didn't see anything. So I guess it could have been people, but I guess I'll never know. But whatever it was, it could whistle and throw rocks. Every time I'm hiking alone now and I hear the gibberish ahead of me, I think about that incident and I think to myself, here we go again. Then one day I was talking to an old timer who told me that the gibberish in rock throwing was the wild men, namely Bigfoot. I never wanted to believe in the phenomenon and I had never seen any indication that Bigfoot existed previously. Now I'm not sure what to believe. How do I begin this? I think I saw a black-eyed child, and for those of you who don't know what they are, those are children who are very pale, and they are usually between the ages of 6 and 19. 
They have very blonde hair, and they don't have any irises in their eyes. Their eyes are completely black. There's no white, all black. So I went online after this happened to me, and people have written stories about their experiences with meeting black-eyed children. And they say that one. They can't come into where you are unless you invite them in. They will usually pretend to be lost or need to use your phone or your bathroom to get into your house or your car or whatever. If you say no, then they can't come in. Secondly, nobody really has an explanation for what they are. Some people think that they are demons. Some people think that they're ghosts or aliens. Nobody really knows, so yeah. I had heard of them before I had this experience, but I really don't have any answers, even after I've had this experience. So my ride. I live in Pennsylvania. I work in Delaware, and my ride to work is this very long, winding farm road. At one point, I make a ride onto another farm road, and this road is a very, very tight space. It's two ways, so you can go one way in cars. We can go the opposite way. But it's a very, very tight space. So when you're driving the car beside you that's coming the opposite way, you both kind of have to slow down just to be safe. It's kind of a dangerous road. Now on each side of you are very, very tall grass hills. So if a cop was going to pull you over, I'm not really sure exactly where you'd pull off. You'd have to ride down the road for a while before you'd be able to pull over because it's that type of space and there's nowhere to pull over, really. So I'm driving this road on a Saturday. I had to be at work at 3 p.m. and it's around 2.30 p.m. I'm on this road, this very tight space, and cars are coming the opposite way, and I'm slowing down so that we can both pass safely. I look to my right, and there's a break in the hills, in the grass hills, where there's an entrance to a farm, and I look over, and in that entrance is a little boy. First of all, on Saturday it was 40 degrees, and he was not dressed like it was 40 degrees. He did not have a coat on, no hat, no scarf, no gloves, nothing. He had on a red and gray striped shirt and jeans. The way he was dressed and the way he looked, he didn't look like he was from this period. He looked like he was maybe from the 1950s. He was very, very pale, and he had very blonde hair, and he was staring. He was standing on his bike. He wasn't on his bike. His bike was to the right of him, and he's holding it, and he's stiff. He's stiff as a board, and at first I actually thought he was a statue. So anyway, he's standing there staring straight ahead like his eyes are really big. He's staring straight ahead, and his eyes are black, like they're completely black, and I'm looking right in his face. He's not that far from me. He's maybe 50 feet away, and I'm looking right in his face, and he's just staring straight ahead and not moving. I was really creeped out by it, and then my window started to fog up, but only my window, my windshield, my back windshield, the passenger seat, or the back seat's None of them fogged up, only mine. I really don't believe in this stuff, like I don't think about strange phenomena. I don't read too much into it, whatever, so I know that this sounds crazy, but I promise you I'm not crazy and this also isn't a trolling video, like I'm not putting this out there for attention or anything. I'm just putting it out there because I'm hoping someone has a logical explanation for what I saw. After all, like I said, I don't believe in this stuff, and I would hope that there is a logical explanation for this little boy. So I went to work, and I told a few people what had happened, and they were like, maybe it was a statue. I have to take that road home, so by the time I leave work, it's about 12.30 a.m., and I'm driving on this road. This would be Sunday morning, and I'm driving very fast, even though the speed limit's only 35. I'm driving very fast because I do not want to be on this road, and I glance over very quickly, and at the gate to the entrance to the farm is, it's not closed. There's no little boy there. There's no statue, so he definitely was not a statue. I don't have an explanation for what he was. The thing is, though, if he was a real little boy, and maybe I'm imagining this, there's nowhere for him to ride that bike. I googled that road thinking that maybe he was a ghost and to see if a little boy had been killed there. The only thing I got was a man who had been killed there. He was a grown man, though. 
He had been hit by a car, but that's the thing. It's so dangerous for a pedestrian on that road. I work in a rather isolated park, and as a result, I'm given housing there. I used to live in the housing full time. Then life became busier. I found myself needing to be in the city more often, and so I moved some of my things into the guest room of my parents' house. Nowadays, I only stay in my cabin in the mountains one or two nights a week. It helps me cut down on my commute. I'm now reconsidering those nights, though. I'm still having a hard time believing I saw what I saw and heard what I heard. I've lived up there for four years now. There's a lot of wildlife up there, so sounds and movement in the night don't scare me much. I've gotten used to it, and thanks to the extreme light sensitivity I inherited from my mom's side of the family and my awesome headlamp. I kept from my ex-boyfriend, I can usually identify the things that go bump. I've gotten so comfortable with being alone with the wildlife, sometimes I even talk with them. If you sit still long enough, the sounds of the forest become louder and more distinct. With enough practice, you can imitate calls well enough to engage in conversation with owls and foxes. All it takes is some patience. I guess what I'm saying is, I'm very familiar with the local wildlife. It's my job to be familiar with them as a naturalist. I listen, watch, and wait more than the average human occupant of this park. I know it like the back of my hand. I can track most of the wildlife easily, hike trails in the dark, and I'm well acquainted with my furry and feathery neighbors. This is why I'm so worried. We have a diverse array of carnivores and omnivores in our park, and if you've ever tried identifying scats, you know that anything that eats meat leaves a distinct-looking sort of poop behind. The foxes in my park prefer to hang around my cabin, and so I find a lot of their scat, and they bring me things, too, occasionally. Usually it's stuff like food and things they think are food. I have been brought dirty bandanas, all manners of food wrappers, and once they even brought me an unwrapped chocolate bar. First I started noticing the foxes were upset. They were crapping on the garbage can handled near my cabin. They tend to crap excessively when they're feeling especially territorial. But I've always been on pretty good terms with them, so I thought maybe they were upset they couldn't get to the garbage in the locking trash can. I emptied the garbage, but it continued. Then I started seeing sign I didn't recognize. The first of it fascinated me. I found it about a month ago. It was clearly the leavings of a large omnivore. It consisted of a lot of acorns, which oddly enough had the shells removed before ingestion. Most large omnivores in our area don't have the dexterity to shell an acorn, let alone the taste for it. They're full of tannins, which upset the digestive tract and taste awful. I thought perhaps it had just been really hungry, but as I poked around in the rather large pile, I found some small bones as well. The hunting should be good this time of year, and it was clearly able to hunt. As I watched the beetles clear the pile away over the next week, some larger bones made themselves apparent. They were about an inch or two in length apiece, and maybe one-third to half an inch in diameter, with a sort of tapered look to them, like they were pinched in the middle and flared at the ends. They had markings on them, which made me think they'd been chewed before they were eaten. Then I started hearing new sounds, and the foxes stopped visiting me. About three weeks ago, the foxes stopped showing up. I thought maybe their little family. There's five of them, a mom, another female, probably from a previous litter, and three kits that hang out. I have never seen Dad, but I don't think he sticks with them. We lost one of the kits last year when it was at its tiniest and most adorable stage of life to some kind of disease. I just glad the others survived. That weekend, both nights, I heard steps outside. I usually dismiss stuff like that as a possum or raccoon, or more frequently it would be a skunk, but these steps were distinctly bipedal sounding. I could tell it wasn't human, though. Humans make more noise than that. 
It would walk slowly, and I could hear small amounts of the dry brush crackling under its feet outside my window, and then it would step on a branch and make a louder sound, and I would hear more rapid steps retreating. I pride myself on how well I've adjusted to being still and quiet in the forest. Most visitors can't even spot me if I'm three feet off trail observing, unless I say hello to them. Most humans are loud and oblivious to all the things that watch passively from the understory as they charge ahead, staring at the trail beneath their feet. That's how I know this wasn't a human. But I've got other proof, too. My bathroom and kitchen are not attached to my cabin. They are two separate buildings. I know it's weird, but I guess it was cheaper to build it the way it was built. Sometimes at night, if I have to take a piss, I'll just get up, trot outside naked, and squat by a tree if I feel lazy. Other times, I'll don my boots and slog up to the bathroom. Well, that's what I did last week. As I walked to the bathroom, I could swear I heard other footsteps. Every time I stopped, so would they. It was like I had an echo. I stopped for a moment to let my eyes adjust to the dark. It was not a full moon, but a rather large moon last week, and the sky was pretty clear, so it didn't take long. It also didn't hurt that my power has been out, so there were no lights on to it with me. I looked around to see if I could find any animals nearby. I tried not to move too much because I didn't want to scare it away if it was one of my foxes visiting me. It must have seen me searching because all I saw was a blur of movement not ten feet away from me as it disappeared into the deeply eroded creek bed beside the pathway. It was way too big to be a fox or even a puma, and way too fast to be a human. I didn't make a sound as I noped the F out of there and sprinted to the bathroom. I locked myself in there. The door is solid wood and stayed there till daylight. At least I didn't piss myself although I came damn close. I took a note from the deer's book and went to ground, stayed as quiet as I could, and didn't close my eyes for a second. I couldn't very well not come to work this weekend. It seemed kind of dumb once it was all over. I shrugged it off as being a trick of the shadows, or maybe a buck that was up way later than deer usually are. Mind you, my power is still out, and it's been rainy and stormy all weekend. I don't know what the F happened last night. I don't know what it wants. I don't know if I want to go back. I was laying in bed playing on my laptop. I had the gas-powered generator running to charge my various electronics and run a small space heater since it was so damn cold and windy. When I heard a loud metallic bang from outside, I assumed the worst. I figured a tree branch had gotten blown down by the heavy wind onto my car. So I groaned and got out of bed. Then I remembered the weird shit from the beginning of the month and the weirder shit from last weekend, and I grabbed my Pulaski before opening the door. My poor mama fox. There she was, on my doorstep. My blood ran cold, and I felt like my stomach was suddenly full of adrenaline. There was a huge smear and splatter of blood halfway up my white door where she'd hit it. I didn't step foot out of my cabin. I couldn't think I was torn between rage... Fear, disgust, shock, and confusion. Then I looked up and saw it. It was maybe eight feet away. My night vision is good, guys. I know what I saw. It was the size of a tall man, and it was covered in a fine layer of coarse hair. I can't make out colors very well at night time, so I can't be sure what color. Its eyes were dark. I couldn't see pupils. I didn't stand there looking at it for long, but I could tell it was gaunt and kind of man, shaped except that its arms were long. I'm also pretty sure it's male. It is the single weirdest thing I've ever seen in my forest. I've learned since living here that things that act like prey quickly become it, so I lifted my Pulaski up above my head and screamed at it like you would at a puma. It didn't budge an inch, but it did talk. It only said one thing, sister, and it said it in a whisper, a gruff tenor whisper. I once again noped the F out, slammed my door closed. This one is made out of metal, threw the dead bolt, pushed my whole arm wire up against the window, and cuddled with my Pulaski till the sun came up. 
All night I could hear the footsteps around my cabin. When I heard sounds on the outside walls, it took everything I had not to scream. It tried to get up to the roof. I have a skylight, so needless to say, I was waiting with more than just a little apprehension. I don't have internet or phone access up there, and it's isolated enough that I have no cell reception. The way we communicate out there is with radios and repeaters. I don't know what to do. I'm a woman of science, and so are all my other co-workers. I'd probably be laughed out of my job if I told them about what happened. I know I wasn't dreaming or seeing things because the fox was still there the next day, so I notified my co-workers about a dead animal. They told me to just kick her to the side or use a shovel, I decided. F that, and I buried her. I'm torn between anger and fear. This thing killed the mother that was providing for those kits needlessly. It didn't even eat her. I think it's hunting me. I'm by myself up there, too. I can bring the radio with me at night, but the response time for emergency crews to my area is around an hour. I don't know what to do. I don't want to let it kill any of the others. But what can I even do if I'm not safe either? Am I losing my mind? That it okay, so I think I have a plan. Tomorrow I'm going to go start the process of buying a gun. This is going to take at least ten days, inconvenient in this case, but I understand why the process is in place. So I'll take some other precautions. I'll see if I can borrow my neighbor's kangels. These are huge dogs. And if not, I'll see if I can invite my buddy up. I don't know if he'll believe me, but he's a dirty, horny son of a bitch. So I know he'll come up with me one way or another. I will tell one of our rangers that there's a predatory animal I don't recognize in my living area. If he blows it off, I'll tell our other ranger, Sir Per Insecure Power Abuser Mother F, that I think an armed person is casing my place. I'll go up early on Friday and scatter some ash on the ground to see if I can get tracks. I won't stay. I'll go back to the city and get up early to go to work and stay Saturday night. Hopefully with Kangles or my buddy. I've got my Pulaski, which I'm honestly way more comfortable with than I would be with a gun. I'll also have my grandpa's K-bar just in case. I'll sleep and go, close and keep a bucket for bathroom use in the cabin. I'll barricade my window. I can't barricade my skylight, can't make any modifications to my unit. It's a rental but I can get up on the roof and throw a box over it so that no light comes out. I just got a call from maintenance not long ago saying my power is back on, so now it's a concern. They've been working on the power pole that got taken out for a while now. Management finally put the squeeze on them, and it's finally done. If I can't get kangels or boy toy for companionship, I'll try to put together enough of those spike boards to put on the roof. I won't have to make as many of them that way as that shit sounds labor-intensive. It's going to be a week till I have more for you, but I will update. Please let me know if you guys have any more ideas or theories. Part 2 So I came back up the mountain yesterday to prepare. Nothing seemed out of the norm. I saw no signs of life, though. No tracks or scat from the foxes or any other creature, for that matter. The blood from Mama Fox had washed off from the rain we got. There was barely a trace left when I got there. But I could still easily find the mound of turned soil from where I buried her. I sprinkled ash all around my cabin and the garbage cans with an old coffee can. I'd poked holes in the bottom of to work as a sieve, hoping I'd get some tracks. It was filthy work, and I was covered from hip to toe in gray. By the time I was done... This morning upon getting here, I saw nothing in the ash. Nothing has visited my cabin at all. That in itself is strange. Even without the foxes visiting, I would have expected some raccoons or a skunk or even some of the larger nocturnal beetles, millipedes or centipedes. They're pretty ballsy creatures. Not everything in the park is lifeless, though. I went down to get a look at the creek after the rains. We haven't had many hikers recently. The weather keeps them away. However, the wildlife does gravitate towards the swollen creeks. 
I washed my hands in the creek just to feel how cold the water was, and looked up in time to catch a glimpse of two steel heads chasing each other to a gravelly deep spot. Hopefully they're off to make some babies. The rain came very late this year and hasn't been very heavy. The drought is killing us slowly. I wonder if the creature is at all related to this dramatic shift in weather patterns we've witnessed. The alders are beginning to sprout new leaves, and we have various different fungi popping up all over the place. It's certainly a good time of year to be an herbivore, but I'm not sure how long it will remain that way. We need rain badly, and if we don't get it, the herbivores will feel it first. After that, the carnivores will go hungry or have to find new food sources. The scavengers no doubt will do very well for themselves until the very end. I've initiated the process for buying a 12-gauge shotgun. The cheapest I could find was about $200. That's breaking the bank for me. On my lunch break, I visited my cabin to set up the cans and my other defense. I have two forks eight sheets of plywood. I put roughly 1,000 by three-pointed screws through them. I looked awfully weird driving up here with them strapped to the top of my car. I have a small 90 Civic. I put those on my roof at lunch. The idea is that the creature will make a lot of noise climbing up if it comes in contact with the cans. If that doesn't deter it, I'll at least be awake at that point, if I can even get to sleep. If it isn't deterred and continues up to the roof, the screws will make it impossible for it to make any further progress. I'll barricade my window again with my armoire and throw the deadbolt on my, thankfully, metal front door. On Thursday, I told our natural resources guy about thinking there was a large invasive predator stalking on my property. He sort of just shrugged it off, said it was probably a mountain lion, and told me to make sure to keep my window closed and not dally to long outside during sunset. I told our ranger, and he shrugged and told me to be careful. I was kind of expecting this, to be honest. So next step is to tell the paranoid ranger that I think there's a person stalking me. He's on shift tomorrow. Unfortunately, my neighbor does not want to let me dog sit. It's probably for the better, because I don't know that I can accommodate her extremely large and expensive dogs. My horny guy. Friend got roped into a committed relationship between the last time I spoke with him and now, so he's spending Valentine's Day with his very pretty new girlfriend. Honestly, it feels like insult to injury, but I'll get over it. Which means tonight I'm alone, except for that thing. All I have with me is my Pulaski my grandpa's K-bar, and a can of bear mace. Please keep me in your thoughts. I'm terrified. If I don't edit with another update by this time tomorrow, you'll know something happened. It's 12.30 p.m. here. Edit remembered a couple of other recommendations from last week and went back to put a box over my skylight and put salt around the perimeter of my room. I don't want to impact the soil outside my cabin, so I just trail the line of salt against the base of the wall all the way around my room, and very thickly at the door. Edit update. Oh, God, it's not an animal. I don't know what it is, but I don't even think it's biological. I don't understand why I'm still alive. When I got off work last night, I immediately locked myself in my cabin and set up my barricade. I had a bucket for the bathroom and some cold pizza I had brought up from the city for dinner. I figured I would need some comfort food considering I'm about to start my period and, well, considering everything else. I didn't drink any beer, though, because I knew it would be important to keep my wits about me. I started hearing the steps around the cabin at about 8 p.m. The sun was well below the hills at this point. I lay very still and just listened. It grew very quiet after about thirty men of very light footsteps around my cabin. Suddenly a loud and forceful blow to the side of my cabin shook the whole thing and caused my room to echo with the resulting bang. I couldn't help myself and an impulsive gasp escaped my lips. If I hadn't known any better, I would have thought a large tree must have fallen nearby. Three more explosive blows rapidly followed maybe a half a second apart from each. Other, on every side of my cabin, 
The first blow seemed to be on the wall to the right of the wall with my door. The second struck on the back wall that my window is on. The third was on the wall to the left of my door, and the fourth was on the door itself. Hiding under the covers doesn't make that shit go away, but I tried. I was trying to be as quiet as possible while I cried. The sound it made chilled my blood, gave me goosebumps all over, and turned my stomach into a walnut-sized knot. It was high-pitched, just like its whisper from last weekend. It was angry. The sound was a mixture between a howl and a scream, and lasted for about ten seconds as it pounded twice more on my door, shaking my entire cabin. I then heard scrabbling against the door, and my doorknob made that small, metallic sound it always does when I touch it. That sound old, loose doorknobs always make. Then I heard the can. At first the cans jangled a bit. Then they really started rattling hard, and it made that god-awful sound again. I thought I was going to puke when I heard a smack on my roof. It howled even more loudly. I felt relieved for a moment, thinking I'd wounded it with the screws and might even get some sort of DNA sample out of this. I then heard the board sliding around on the roof, and I nearly shut myself. I had anchored the boards together with a couple of chains and some screws and bolts. It wasn't attached to the roof, but they were attached to each other. I think that's the only thing that kept it from getting the boards off of my roof. I think it gave up and hopped back down to the ground with a grunt. That's what it sounded like from inside. I took the covers off of my head and let the snot and tears pour down my face for fear of making noise and trying to clean myself up. I heard the steps very faintly around my cabin again. Then they stopped and I heard a soft, meaty thump against the wall closest to my head. I don't know what it wants, but I know it definitely wants something. I don't think I want to know exactly what it is that it wants, though. I could hear it whisper in that creepy, raspy tenor again. It must have had its face pressed against the wall. Smell you. I didn't know what to do, but I remembered what one of you had said about talking to it. Since it clearly knew I was there, I gave up all precedent of trying to pretend I wasn't. What I said to it was, go away. I don't want you here. This is my territory. I'm armed. I tried to make my voice sound brave. Oh, Christ, the sound it made will haunt my nightmares for whatever small portion of life I have left. One word, but the terrifying part was the way it said. It want... I don't know that I can adequately portray the way it said it in text, but I'll try. It said it like this. Want... It started in that weird tenor but by the time it hit the ah sound, it had slid downwards to a deep, bizarre, and horrible roar, like the sound it had made earlier, but deeper than any human vocal range I had ever heard, and loud enough to make my ears ring through the walls. In a frenzy of fear and rage, I lost my shit. I started screaming and pounding on the wall, yelling at it to go away. Go away. Go away. When I exhausted myself, I sat back on my bed with aching hands and covered in cold sweat. It was silent outside. I sat and waited and listened to the silence. I sat there for many hours. It was a little after 5 a.m. when I heard something slide up the wall of my cabin. It had been sitting there, waiting. It had waited till sunrise. I didn't leave my cabin until about 8 a.m. when I was completely sure it was long gone. I went outside to see the damage. There was soot everywhere. I'm not talking the ash I'd sprinkled on Friday. I'm talking black soot. There were huge splotches of it on my door, on my wall, and on the screws right above my door. The thing leaves soot behind. The soot smells like decomp, but it's definitely burnt black powdery residue. It also left some footprints behind. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but just judging by these prints, I don't think this thing is from here or anywhere we even know of. I'll upload some pictures of the footprints today. I still don't know what to do, but I no longer think a gun is going to help me. What is it? What can I even do?
This happened to me. Picture this. You're out in the middle of nowhere, miles away from the nearest population center. Just got done putting your fire out and are getting ready to go to sleep in your tent. The sun has been down for almost an hour. The whole time you've been at this location, you haven't seen any animals. Then as you are trying to sleep, you hear crunching leaves and footsteps around your campsite. You grab your air horn in case it's black bear. They scare off pretty easily, so it shouldn't be too hard. But you also have a can of bear mace just in case things get ugly. You slowly and quietly unzip a tiny part of your tent door so you can peek out. You see a silhouette cast by the moonlight of a human standing near where your fire was with what looks to be a rifle held in their hands. As you see them gently kick to ashy remains of your campfire spot, then looks around your site and over your tent before just casually walking off slinging the rifle or the shoulder. If you know a lot about animals, their actions can be mostly predictable, but people out in the middle of nowhere with a gun snooping around your spot, not even seven feet from you? That is more terrifying than any animal. I'd rather wake up to a grizzle snooping around my camp. I grew up in the desert on the outskirts of California. There was a shortcut that I would take that went through a giant patch of untouched desert to get home from school every day. One particular day, I was just walking through like normal, and this giant bush started shaking violently when I walked by it. I was understandably terrified. A creature appeared from the bush. It was a jackrabbit. It looked at me for two seconds and then quickly took off. The legit craziest thing I ever saw, though, was a stain-covered mattress that looked recently used. There was all kinds of drug paraphernalia, broken beer bottles, and used condoms scattered everywhere. I was leaving the area when I saw two sketchy-looking guys and a woman entering the shortcut. We missed each other by, like, five minutes. cruising through New Mexico near a town called Aztec. At the time, there was a highway called 666. No joke. Well, anyway, I'm driving about 80 miles per hour, and I look to my right, just checking things out, like that he mirrors make sure nothing is dragging. Well, I notice these red dots in the distance about 200 yards out. Well, what was weird was that it looked like they were running, like eyes with a body can't really explain it how I knew those eyes were attached to head attached to some bipedal body. Well, those red dots kept getting closer and closer to me. And no joke, there was this thing that looked human-like, but it was elongated and pale. But not pale white dead, but pale grayish, wearing some type of top hat with long hair and the most, most, most evil smile I've ever seen. My friend and I have never experienced something like this before in our entire lives. Recently, my mom had to go to an old high school friend's birthday party. It was convenient for us to go because a family friend has a farmhouse we could stay at in central Florida. My mom didn't feel comfortable going alone because the farmhouse can be really creepy at night due to the lack of light on the property and it just being in the middle of nowhere. So I told my mom I would go with her as long as I could bring a friend. We get to the property, and it is a huge 52-acre plot of land with cows, horses, and open fields with a tree line surrounding the land. We looked on a map to see exactly where we were and saw we were right next to two Native American forests. We unpacked our stuff and were able to check all of the property out because the owner had a golf cart type of TV. My friend saw a TikTok talking about skinwalkers and their Native American name, and we didn't know any better, so we were talking about them all day on all parts of the property. Later that night, we saw a video talking about how even saying their name could provoke them to come. We immediately got kind of scared because we found out the party my mom was going to would be an hour away. 
and we would be in the farmhouse at night all alone. As the sun started to set, we quickly noticed that none of the windows on all four walls of the house had curtains. With the lights on in the house, you could only see your reflection from the inside, but could see right in from the outside. As I said, the property had little to no light, but some floodlights were motion, activated on the back porch of the farmhouse. Just a quick description of the farmhouse. It was a one-bedroom, one-bathroom house with a little living room and a kitchen. There were two doors, one leading out to the fields in the back, and the other was directly attached to the horse stables, which was more of a lounging area, as there were tables and a bar with a giant flat screen. Okay, so now we can get into the scary part of the night. My friend was putting away our dinner in the fridge, and I went outside to smoke. As soon as I walked up to the table in the horse stable, I heard something really close to me and ran back inside. As soon as I came back inside, my friend asked if I knocked on the window. Of course, I'd said no, but my friend found that hard to believe, as she definitely heard a distinct knocking at the window. This window is important to the story, because the floodlights were right outside of it. I forgot to mention we had brought our dog, and she was fine the entire day until it became dark out. When my friend and I were both inside, we just brushed it off until a floodlight outside the window turned on and my dog bolted to see who was there. My dog sat there and barked at the window, but when we went to go check, there was nothing there. No both of us really needed a cigarette, so we both decided to go outside and give it one more try. My friend stepped outside and looked to her right. I was confused and told her we should stay in the stable, so we walked to a table. As soon as we sat down, there were another two knocks on the other side of the building. We got up and sprinted towards the house where we locked ourselves in, and where my friend told me she heard whispering coming from the right as soon as we stepped out of the house. At this point, we were really freaked out, and the dog had begun to start barking at the same window again, where the light turned on once again to nothing there. The only comfort we could get at this time was calling my friend's parents. In some of our friends, however, after a short ten minutes of us talking to people, our service got out and both of our calls failed. We couldn't text anyone either, and this really scared us because we hadn't had a problem with our service the entire day. We once again tried to relax and put on a movie, but that's when we heard something jump on the roof. And walk above the room we were in. My friend and I immediately leapt up and ran to the bathroom. We didn't know what to do, but at this point I thought our best bet was to run to the car, which was at least 40 feet away, and get off the property until my mom and the owner could come back. We grabbed our stuff, still hearing whatever was on the roof, walk around to where we moved in the house. As soon as we got to the door, my friend pushed me and said, listen, which is when we heard two knocks right at the door we were standing in front of. It then ran towards the back of the house, where all of the floodlights on the back porch went on. The dog was going crazy, and my friend and I were on the verge of tears. I told her we had to run to the car and get out of there, which we did. As we were running, we could hear something on the roof of the stables, almost as if it was following us to the car. We sped off and sat at a parking lot two miles away for two hours until my mom and her friend returned to the property. They escorted us back in, and as we were all walking through the stables to get to the door of the house, there was another knocking in the stable. The owner said she heard it and went to go check what it was, but saw nothing. Something my friend and I had noticed was that the sounds of the crickets were back again. When we left the house earlier that night, there wasn't a sound that could be heard other than whatever was on the roof. My mom ended up sleeping there at the house, but my friend and I were traumatized. We felt as though the farmhouse was peaceful again as soon we got back because we didn't feel any of the negative energy we were feeling earlier that night. We were too scared to even sleep, so we both sat in the bathroom on the floor, apologizing for whatever we might have offended. We honestly don't know what this could have been, but we don't want this post to get taken down for it being framed as a question. We have come to a conclusion of our own on what it was but thought it would be interesting to hear other people's thoughts.
So this happened a few nights ago on Saturday, August 28, 2021, in British Columbia, Canada. I'm not entirely sure if what I encountered was a skinwalker, but here goes. I live in a small to medium-sized town, not a large city, in a suburban neighborhood that's situated close to the Fraser River. Everything around here is mostly woods, and there's also a large Forest Service road system a few blocks away that goes quite far into the bush. A little bit more about my immediate area around my home. Sorry, it helps to understand where everything is. There's a little park across from my house with a small playground and a paved path that goes about 0.4 kilometers until it meets up with the main road. Down the hill from there, there's a newer housing development area that has a large cleared area, previously bush, and a long gravel path that leads to a meadow and eventually the road. If you walk to the bush at the park across from my house and take a ride in the woods, there's a narrow trail that's quite overgrown that pops you out at the start of the hill down to the new development. There's also quite a few trails within that section of bush at the park. About 100 meters away to the right of the hill is another park that connects to the Forest Service road system and endless bush. From the park across my house to the end of the meadow is about one 1.5 kilometer in total. The meadow connects to a large gravel area across from a high school up a hill, which is where this begins. All right, so here's what happened. This was all later at night, around 11.30 p.m. Me and my girlfriend were in the gravel lot in my cell. Across from the high school where we were talking, and she eventually fell asleep as we had been walking around all day, and the fair was in town. About 15 minutes after she was asleep, I started to get an eerie feeling like I was being watched, and had a feeling like we had overstayed our welcome. I didn't like it at all, and always trust my gut when I get feelings like that, so I started to wake up my girlfriend. Just as she was starting to wake up, I heard what sounded like someone shouting, kinda like a who or hi further away downhill into the meadow. I would have disregarded it but it caught me off guard a bit since it sounded almost doubled, like the person had a chorus pedal or pitch shifter on their voice. It spooked me a bit because of that, and I hadn't heard anyone yell like that before. I finished waking up my girlfriend, and we drove away from there into an elementary school parking lot down the road from the hill leading to the new development. I told her what happened, and we joked about it being spooky and whatnot. I then looked up videos to try and find something that matched what I had heard, and Skinwalker's screams or vocalizations were what matched up most. Unfortunately, I scrolled into the comments which mentioned that the further away the scream is, the closer it is to you. It spooked me for a moment, but chuck it all up to coincidence. For fun, we decided to drive down the hill to the new development as it's dark and spooky. It has woods on one side where the park is and has a gravel turnaround for vehicles with a gate at the end where the gravel path starts. As we were going down the hill near the top, I got a very strange and uneasy feeling, almost like a slight panic, but it went away shortly after we got to the bottom of the hill. My girlfriend said she got the feeling as well, so we decided to turn around on a side street and leave. I decided to play some music that always helps take the scared feelings away from me, the Doom Eternal soundtrack, specifically Super Gore Nest, and put the pedal to the metal on the accelerator whilst going up the hill to make me feel more comfortable and like nothing could touch me. When we were about three quarters of the way up the hill, the feeling came back and hit us full force. The closer we got to the top where the trail comes out of, the stronger it got. The only way I can describe it is pure terror. It wasn't fear or dread, it was terror. We both had a physical reaction to it. We got intense chills and we could feel the goosebumps on our skin all over our body. We both started to get choked up and teary-eyed and I became short of breath for a minute. I must have gone from 60 kilometer an hour up the hill. Limit is 50 to 80 after cresting the hill and it felt like if we stopped we surely would have died. It was the most petrifying experience either of us have had. We didn't even see anything. 
have driven past many animals at night, from deer to bear to coyotes, etc., and have been outside walking home alone at night with a bear going through garbage cans at my neighbor's houses. I've dirt biked past a mama bear with cubs and mama moose, and I thought those were scary experiences. No scary experience I've had from a car accident when I was young to almost being hit four times doing road construction from dumb drivers can even come close the feeling I had that night. The doom soundtrack turned from the feeling of being a badass into feeling like I had it would be the anthem of my death. It was truly the most terrifying experience of my life. After getting out of Dodge, we went to a well-lit mall parking lot and calmed down for a bit, still shaking. I drove my girlfriend home and had a very anxiety and fear-ridden drive home. As the park across from my house connects only 150-ish meters away from where the encounter took place. When I got home, I made sure everything was locked up tight, had a little bit of weed to calm down, and then went to bed while on video call with my girlfriend. That night around 3.35 a.m., I woke up and had a mild return of the panic feeling for around five minutes before falling back asleep. I dreamt of the experience the entire night. The next morning, my girlfriend told me she heard tapping on my window at around 3 a.m., which made me shudder as my window is around nine feet off the ground. I don't know what to make of the experience and would appreciate some guidance into what this may have been. I've never liked walking in those woods alone, as I always get a creepy feeling, but I'm definitely not walking to my house alone at night ever again. We're going to go back and drive there at night again to see if it happens again. Not sure if that's a stupid idea, but my curiosity about cryptids and the like has been piqued, and I need to know what's lurking around here. Thanks for reading, and I'd appreciate any help or insight on what it may be. I was driving with my friend to his home in southern Arizona. We had to drive through several reservations, mostly had that I shouldn't look them in the eye or even pay attention. A couple hours into the drive, only me and my friend, who was driving, were awake. I saw a man dressed all in tan leather and wearing a large, wide-brimmed hat standing by the road. I didn't listen to what my friend said and looked at it directly. Every couple of miles, I saw this same man, always on the road, always looking at me. I got glimpses of his face sometimes. He appeared to have none. Eventually, I shut my eyes until we got to his town because I was afraid. I didn't see anything further while we stayed there. We go back to the west just about every year. The last time we went, we spent a night in a town in the mountains where his family had a cabin and we got stuck in the snow. We called a towing company and a single man came to help us out. We talked at length with him, or at least I did. I recall him being native with long black hair and wearing a tan suit, including an animal skin on his shoulders. No hat like the person I saw on the road. He was very friendly and wanted to eat dinner with us. We said no because we didn't have enough food for him and us. He offered to go buy us food and bring it back. We said no to this also. Recently, my friends and I were talking about this day. They didn't see a native man. They claimed that we were helped by a man with short blonde hair and a southern accent, that he was wearing snow gear and never asked to eat with us. My friend asked me if I'd seen anything unusual somewhere else, and I told him about the man on the road. He told me that I saw a skinwalker and it was following me. I live on the East Coast, so he proposed that it only came looking for me when I was in the area. Since that encounter, I have almost constant dreams about it. Going back to Arizona, what do you make about this encounter? Besides my one friend, no one else believes me. It creeps me out to this day. I went to Nevada a few weeks ago and had no incidents. We're supposed to go back to Arizona in the winter. I'm a little nervous. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.